All right, let's see. Eric, uh, digging the return of your podcast and the new format. I have a couple of question submissions. One, we interviewed folks live for the Meetcast at Expo West, and the most consistent trend everyone noted from the show was adaptogens. What are your thoughts on adaptogens? Flash in the pan fad or the unicorn cure to cancer? Surely it can't be anything in between. <laughs> that, would, that would involve new ones. <laughs> Let's answer that one first. Answer that one first. I I really like adaptogens. Uh, I've kind of leaned more towards some of the uh, kind of medicinal mushroom angle on that. Chaga, uh, uh, cordyceps, um, rhodiola. uh, Man, I'm blanking on some of the other things. Uh, All of them have really cool effects. What, What seems to be a recommendation is to cycle them. So maybe you do one adaptogen or adaptogen blend, work your way through that, try a different adaptogen or adaptogen blend. Um, Some of these things are kind of hormetic stress inducers of others are kind of immune system modulators. So they they kind of tweak the way that macrophages and and different things react to the the kind of internal environment. Um, There is an argument again to probably uh, rotating through them. And and the, the one interesting thing about the, the adaptogens, they are really valuable, but what a lot of people think is that they can live like an asshole and then take <laughs> adaptogens and continue living like an asshole. And you just right. can't do that. I tried to do that. And this is, I, I think like my, my training at age 40 post or something like that, I talked about like how cratered I, I was. It was right after the I caveman show where I starved for two weeks, Mm -hmm. I lost 20 pounds. We were up all night. Like I had thyroid and adrenal issues Mm -hmm. after that. And uh, doc Parsley worked with me to get that stuff addressed and adrenal support adaptogens were a key feature of that. But I also had to quit going on the road so much. I had to super prioritize my sleep, although we had a kid right on the heels of that. So that that was great timing. (laughs) But, you know, I had to modify my lifestyle. But the lifestyle modification plus the adaptogens created a synergistic effect. And now I can get back out on the road and do reasonably well. Like I kind of cratered a little bit after my low-carb Breckenridge deal, but I had food poisoning and a head cold and all mm-hmm. kinds of stuff. It was kind of a disaster and I was a little beat up after that. But I, I think that they are really valuable. But to your point, they're not the unicorn cure for cancer. But I also wouldn't call them a flash in the pan. I think that they're going to be a really powerful adjunctive tool that folks can use going forward. And then the next question, does our gut microbiome have the ability to adapt and evolve as we age, or is it locked in at a certain age? We hear often that our exposure to good bacteria as a child impacts our autoimmunity later in life. What's so critical about those childhood years? Is it simply our ability to, is it simply our ability to adapt declining as we age? Uh, is our ability, uh, yeah, basically yeah, is our ability yeah. to adapt declining it, as we it's age? It's a great question. And, you know, one of the challenges of the gut microbiome is that it is incredibly labile. So they will sequence someone's gut microbiota in the morning and then do the same person in the evening. And there's very little overlap between the two. Like it looks like it's an entirely different person. So uh, some of the exceptions to that, uh, if we have some overtly pathogenic bacteria or maybe even some fungal overgrowth or something, those things are kind of consistent and, and you'll see that. But it's really labile, like it, it changes a lot. And this is part of my challenge with um, some of the folks out there that will, will kind of magically divine like, oh, if you have this, then we do this. If you have that, then we do that. And I, I, I don't know, maybe they're way smarter than I am, but this is part of the reason why I really like Dr. Michael Ruscio's approach to gut health. And do we, oh, I moved the book. I was gonna give him a another plug, but um, uh, it depends and it's labile. And so we, we're, we're in what's called the taxonomic stage of understanding the gut microbiota and the microbiota at large. Tax, the taxonomic stage is still where we're naming shit. Like we are just, okay, this is this and that's that. Like we know for a fact that a, a remarkable percentage of our gut microbiota, we haven't even really been able to culture it so it's difficult to then sometimes identify it. Like they're doing some some genetic analysis, but the, there's uh, there's bacteria that we we don't we haven't even really pinned down yet, and so they still need to be named and cataloged, and then we need to identify you know what genes they have because the genes modify what type of metabolic processes they impart to us and into our gut. So there's a lot going on there as to the early childhood exposure to different organisms. 
the best way that I could describe this, I'm not an immunologist, but the best way I could describe this is that it's tuning the immune system. And so when they looked at the immune systems, uh, in particular of children of non-Westernized populations, they tended to have very little in the way of, of uh, allergies and eczema, food intolerances and what have you. If we then shift to westernized populations, but kids that live on a farm, and so they're exposed to all kinds of animals, and they play outside, dirt. and they get dirt on them and everything. No they're, hand sanitizers. No hand sanitizers. These kids have a gut profile that's quite different than the, the say, like the urban kids that, that didn't get that experience. It's, it's, say, less robust than the non-westernized folks, which wouldn't be surprising, but it's better than in many ways. And we have fewer allergies and food intolerances and tendency towards autoimmunity. And then you have this other cross-section of folks that live in this super sanitized environment. They were perhaps not breastfed and, you know, all kinds of other stuff. They end up with some, some uh, increased likelihoods of uh, gut issues, food sensitivities, allergies, and all, all that type of stuff. And... Um, maybe the next time we get Mike Ruscio on the podcast, we could dig into exactly what's going on in that early childhood environment, but it certainly is tuning the immune response. It's like the, the, both the, our, our, our genes and our gut and the microbiota are looking for something to kind of give it some signal and response stuff. It's like a call and response kind of deal and absent that, that tuning, what can tend to happen is the gut then starts becoming antagonistic towards food particles and it, because of the, the lack of proper tuning. So you can make a case that everybody needs to get their kids an animal, you, <laughs> a dog, a, it, cat, it, a it, sheep. You know, I mean, it, it definitely appears to be beneficial from that immune tuning standpoint, for sure. Although don't tell, who is it? Ray Audet. That's, that's all about the oh, myco yeah, you can't have a cat. plasmosis. Yeah. Like cat, <laughs> cats and myco plasmosis will, will make your penis fall off apparently. So